It's my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Burgraff to you this morning. Um, as many of you know, he is uh, one of uh, the professors at Zach Seminary, and he is also the author of the book that we uh, went through this spring. Many of you went through this spring on discipleship. We're so thrilled to have him here this morning. I want to share a couple of things about Dr. Burgraff was uh, saved at the age of eight. He graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Biblical Studies from Maranatha University. After graduating, he attended Calvary Baptist Theological Seminary in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, where he graduated with his MDiv in 2003. During his master's program, he served as a missionary in Mons, Belgium in the summer of, 20, of 2002. Upon graduation from his master's program, he moved to Spring Hill, Florida, where he was senior pastor of Bible Baptist Church. In 2008, he moved to uh, Otanawa, is that correct? Owatonna, Minnesota, where he served as senior pastor of Grace Baptist Church and superintendent of the Christian school there. In 2011, he moved to Cary, North Carolina to pursue his doctor of education degree from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest. And during his doctoral courses, Andy served as discipleship pastor at Colonial Baptist Church in Cary, North Carolina. In 2012, he joined Shepherd's Theological Seminary as an adjunct professor of Christian education. Andy graduated with his doctorate from Southeastern in 2014. While continuing to teach in the seminary, he joined Build the Village, now called Communities of Grace International in 2014, where he served as Director of Discipleship. This ministry serves, served all over East Africa. Uh, he has also served as a hospital chaplain in the UNC Medical Center in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. In uh, 2021, Andy was appointed Director of Student Services at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. And in 2023, he was appointed Vice President of Enrollment Services and Strategic Initiatives. He also remains an Assistant Professor of Christian Education at Shepherds. And he met his wife in 2017, and the Burgraffs have, have a blended family of five children, Andrew, Anna, Aaron, Brody, and Tanner. So I want to welcome you here this morning. Let me open us up in prayer, Doctor. Father, what a joy and a privilege it is to be here gathered with my brothers in Christ. And Father, we come even now with an attitude of worship. But we come to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We thank you, Father, uh, for bringing Dr. Burgraff here to us today. Father, may, may we come with an anticipation to grow in you, Lord. And may you, you use the doctor for your glory. I ask all this in the precious name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. we good, Zach? There we go. It's good to be with you. Thank you for coming on a Saturday morning. I know you have busy lives, as we all do. And when I pulled into the parking lot, I was running a little late. And I can't blame traffic because it was like 7 in the morning, right? So, But there were a lot of lights, okay? So I did catch a lot of lights, right? But uh, as I was pulling in, I saw the parking lot full of vehicles. And I thought, oh, this is a joy to my heart that you would come on a Saturday morning. And so thank you so much for being with us. Hopefully this time encourages you, challenges you as we grow more like Jesus Christ. Over the last uh, several decades, honestly, I've been focusing on the areas of discipleship. And it comes out of what God has called us to do in the Great Commission. And we'll talk about that as we get going into the day. Um, Zach is one of my students. He took some of my classes already. He'll take some more as he continues his journey. And so that started the relationship a little bit with your congregation. And uh, then your pastor so graciously asked me to come and spend some time with you this morning. So I look forward to it, guys. Um, we're going to jump right in because there's a lot that I'd love to cover. And we, I know you're thinking, man, we got like hours. Okay, well, I've got like 80 hours of material that I could share with you today, and we're going to try to do this in three, all right? So we're going to do our best. Um, thank you so much. Uh, many of you have gone through uh, my latest book uh, on discipleship today. It's called, uh, it comes out of the first book that I wrote, and we're, this is what we're going to do in our first session, is uh, looking at discipleship in the early church, and that was actually what my focus, my dissertation on. And uh, from that, then I looked at what ancient discipleship, what the early church did, how they discipled believers. 
And when I got into studying that, it became very apparent to me that discipleship today is nothing like it was back then. And, and we have a, we're a group of guys here, so we're just going to cut right to it. We, we have a lot of flabby Christians. And in a Christianity today, as you look across our country, there's some major issues that we are seeing and facing and they're surfacing. It was interesting, I read real recently a quote by John Piper, and he was saying that, and I'll, I'm going to paraphrase it probably badly, but this is what he was talking about. He said, there's a great difference in Christianity from the ancient time where they were talking about dying for their faith versus should we go to the ball game Sunday morning and skip church. We're just in a very different mindset today. And today what I want to do is challenge us in our own walks. It's easy to throw stones out at Christianity at large. It gets harder when we look here. What am I doing? What does this look like in my life, my home, this church, this community? And so to that end, I want to challenge our hearts as we think through discipleship. What God has called us to do. And how are we doing this as men as we serve the Lord? I brought with me uh, today a folder. Hopefully all of you have gotten one of these. Hopefully you grabbed a pen as well. There's a couple things inside there. Obviously on the right side are my notes. And you'll see as we go through, there's some blanks there. That's why I gave you a pen. I'm one of those that if, you know, some of us like to write all over things. And so I brought you some pens and some paper that you can do some of that. Some of you just like to listen to see the pictures, so hopefully you'll enjoy that as well. Um, And then on the left side, and this isn't a shameless plug for the school, but um, at the end of the day, I want you to be aware a little bit of what we are doing, what Zach is doing in his degree program, and so uh, gave you some information there about our seminary. Would love to chat with you if you ever had any questions about that. So what'd you say, Zach? Yeah, he's struggling right now. He's in Greek too, which that's legitimate so <laughs> wait till you get to hebrew all right but uh, no it's uh, zach's doing a good work and uh, he's a joy to having classes and so good you to know a little bit about our school all right so what i'm going to do is uh, there's th- i give you actually kind of four sections the last section will, is two that we'll spend some time with later this morning i want to start off and i'll kind of lay out the map of where we're going to go first we're going to talk a little bit about the history of discipleship and i'm not going to walk us through the church uh, you know all of church history but kind of look at ancient times what was happening and what lessons can we learn from that then in our second section we're going to look at a few different passages of scripture that really challenge our hearts and then at the very end in our final session we'll talk about how to then do this how do we do this in our homes how do we do this with with other men and in this community in our church okay so that's kind of where we're going to go a little bit today what can we learn from the early church as jesus prepared to leave his disciples at the top of page one of our notes he provided them with a final command i've been to a lot of missions conferences and they say the command of the passage is go no, it's not, okay? The, the passage of the, the, actually the command of the passage is make disciples. That's what we're commanded to do. The word go is a participle, okay? It, and for those of you that took English a long time ago like I did, okay, that's a modifying verb. In other words, it's not the strength. It's not the command of the passage, but it is an important word. As we are going, while we are going, God expects us to go. The job then is to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Next section, in our second session, we'll spend some more time on that verse. We're commanded to make disciples. But you know what? This idea of discipleship is sometimes hard to describe. And I've heard it being used now as kind of anything from we're having coffee together, that's discipleship. Uh, Discipleship conference at an arena, that's discipleship. What is discipleship? And so we'll talk through some of these things throughout the day too. But we're having some problems today in discipleship. And Zach, if you can forward to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about this. What are we facing today? This is where you can help me back a little bit. 
When you look at discipleship today, what are some issues you see going on in our churches? Feel free, guys. Just yell something out. (laughs) What are some issues you see? I see a few. And honestly, research backs this up. Okay, and as a doctoral student, you have to go and get all the research facts and all these things. There's some issues that we're facing today. And on your handout, I gave you the four there on the bottom. And I'm going to show you some slides here. One, and there's a lot more I could give you, but one per that kind of talks about a little bit where we're at. So, Zach, those are the four. Click to the next one. That's going to give us the first. Biblical illiteracy. This is an interesting quote. Guthrie in his book, We Will... Will we rise to biblical literacy? He says only 16, this, is, this, this quote shocks me each time I read it, only 16 out of 100 of those who regularly attend our churches read the Bible every day. Notice this then. Another 32% read the Bible at least once per week. So, If this church follows the trend of the rest of America, then when Pastor Mark gets up to preach on Sunday morning, over half of the people haven't cracked their Bible once during that week. That's a problem, guys. That's a major problem. If this book are the words of life if this is the book that keeps us pure if this is our and i can't go into all these passages but when we talk about the armor of god this is your offensive weapon the only one we have all the other pieces of the armor are defensive this is the one offensive weapon when jesus was tempted what did he use to repel satan scripture verses And our people are not in this book. This is a huge issue. And if I can challenge us with one massive thought throughout the day today, it's this. Guys, we've got to be men of this book. We need to be men of this book. This is how you have success. Meditating on this book regularly. This is how we grow. This is how we are prepared to do all good works. And biblical, the rise of biblical illiteracy. Over 50% of the people don't open this once a week. That's shocking. That's a problem. And one of the big issues I'm seeing in churches as I travel around the country is people just don't know this book. And so how can you live out something you're not in and part of? Next slide, Zach. Another issue we're facing is church inactivity. You've often heard the phrase, 10% of the people do 90% of the work. I actually went and studied that. Is that actually accurate? And it's close, but it's more like 2080, okay? (laughs) So statistics show that about 19 to 21% are actually actively involved in church activities. Now, I'm preaching to the choir today because you're here, okay? You're coming on a Saturday morning. This is exciting, and there's a good group of you. But those that actually are plugged in and doing ministry... Typically, we're seeing across the country about 20% of people engaged. Now, here's the deal. I know not 100% will. I'd just be realistic. Okay, we would love that. It's just not going to happen. But we need to get higher with that percentage. 20% is a fraction of our church body Especially when we are the ones to do the work of the ministry. So many times, this is a important encouragement to your pastor 
and I can say this because I'm not your pastor, so I can bark at you. It's good. Oftentimes, we feel like we pay those guys to do the work of the ministry. No, they are to train you to do the work of the ministry. Now, will they exemplify it for you and be participating? Absolutely. But we as a body do the work of the ministry. But only about 20% of people actually do and get involved. Next slide, Zach. Another issue that we're seeing in discipleship that's a problem. And that is that we are de-emphasizing discipleship. A lot of churches emphasize programs. We emphasize getting crowds out. Well, even at times, in, in good churches will emphasize evangelism. But do we really focus on training up people to be followers of Christ? Is that our goal? Do we emphasize that? It was interesting, a huge survey was done here, about a, it's about a decade now ago, maybe a little less, done by Lifeway, and it was literally across the country, and they surveyed 7,000 churches, 28 discipleship leaders, 1,000 Protestant pastors, and 4,000 Protestants in addition to these churches. And after this massive survey, this was their collective statement. There is a discipleship deficiency in most churches resulting in a lack of transformation here's the this is the the stark sentence i want you to note the sad reality is that the daily lives aspirations and desires of many people in our churches mirror those who do not know jesus christ Guys, what they said when we surveyed the country and we looked at discipleship across the board, what ended up being the case is so many Christians just look like the people of the world. They laugh at the same jokes. They have the same desires. They're involved in the same activities. And if you put a mirror up between the lost person and the believer, they look almost identical. That's sad. That's telling me that we're not doing discipleship like we should. Because a disciple of Jesus Christ looks like the master. And I said this in, the, in my book, and if those that went through it, you may have saw this at the outset, and that is, if I went to your neighborhood and I said, where is the Christian who lives on this street? Do they immediately point at your house? If I went to your workplace this week and said, hey, who's the Christian that works here? Do they immediately think of you? Or do we just look like everyone else? We have problems in discipleship today. Our people are not growing in this book. We're not participating in service. And in the end of the day, we look a lot like the world around us. So what do we need to do? Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning. And I want to start at looking at what the early church did. And I've got to move quickly because my time is fleeting and I'm wasting all this time in the introduction. But let's jump into our notes. The ancient church started a program. And Zach, you can kick ahead. There you go. This is a big word. And, if, and this is one of the, my, my last name's hard enough to pronounce and spell. This is even worse, okay? The word is catechumenate. Okay, so if nothing else, you're going to learn a new word today. Okay, catechumenate is the word. And it was the first ancient discipleship program. And it's interesting. This was practiced for about 300 years. And in all the church fathers, we see they practice this training method. 
whether it's Augustine or Cyril of Jerusalem or Athanasius or Theodore of Mopsuasia, all of these gentlemen talk about this discipleship program. It was a very intentional program where they trained believers up in the things of God. And what I want to do is kind of talk us through what they did and learn some lessons from this. Okay, And there's some points to draw from this. So the catechumen was the first intentional systematic training of new believers. And it was conducted in the post-apostolic church. So right after the close of the canon, for about three to four hundred years, we see this happening. Why? I always get asked the question, why did it end? Okay, If you've studied church history, you'll have heard of a guy named Constantine. Okay? And when we study church history, when we come to Constantine, everybody cheers because he stopped persecution and he declared that christian christianity or christian faith was the religion of the empire and everybody is cheering here's the problem he watered down this program because a ton of people just said hey i'm a christian because it was the in thing to do sounds something like some of our churches today And eventually what ended up happening was this became so watered down that it just fell away and it just stopped happening. And that was around 450 A.D. But what were they doing here in this initial program? It was a multi-year, and you can read through some of this on the notes. For sake of time, I'm just going to talk about it because I I just know it off the top of my head. It was about a two to three year training program. And it was intense. And these believers were serious about what they studied. Zach, go to the next slide. The word, catechumenate, comes from a Greek word. Zach, you better know this one. (laughs) From katecheo means to teach or to instruct. In the passive, it means to listen. And it was designed to train up adult converts in the faith. It's a multi-year process to train them theologically and practically. And so as we're going to go through in the next few minutes, let's look at the stages of this. Stage one, and Zach can go to the next slide. Stage one was preliminaries or the entrance period. Now, I've got a lot of notes there. But let me just share with you what this looked like. So when a new believer got saved, they would want to join the church. Now, let's fast forward to 21st century. New believer comes, they get saved here at your church, that's exciting, everybody's thrilled. We typically spend a couple weeks with them, explaining to them what baptism is, we baptize them, and then they join the church, okay? That's kind of what we do in modern times, not so in ancient times, okay? Now, as a disclaimer, let me say this at the outset so you all hear me, okay? I would not pick this up and go one for one for our church today. It wouldn't happen. It couldn't happen. There was some unique things with this program that we couldn't do exactly the same today. However, there's a lot we can learn from this. So in their day, when a person got saved, this is how this went. They came to the congregation and said, we wanted to join the church they would be asked a series of questions. And in this book, the first one that I wrote, Discipleship in the Early Church, I actually list for you, there's, I actually went and got the quotes of the actual questions they asked them. And it was invasive. What do you do for a career? Are you a gladiator? Are you into prostitution? I mean, they go into really nitty-gritty stuff into their lives talk to me about your walk with the lord talk to me about how you got saved and what they would have to do as well is bring with them the person who led them to the lord now i'm going to preview ahead to something that's going to come here in a moment that person that led them to the lord if they were capable sometimes if they were not they were assigned somebody else they became their mentor through this entire process. And our word, in today's English, Godfather and Godmother, comes from this. So they were actually assigned a mentor 
who would lead them through the journey, and that was their godfather. Or the lady, that was their godmother. And they would attest to the salvation they'd seen, the change of nature, what had happened in their lives. And if they approved of all the questions and everything was on the right track and this was legitimate and they were living differently for the Lord and all these things, they allowed them to move to stage two. If not, if they were still a gladiator or they still worked in a brothel or they still, whatever the, I mean, like I said, there's dozens of these questions they asked. They would say, all right, pause. A Christian shouldn't live like this. You go get that cleaned up and then come back to us. Just pause right there. <laughs> that's, that's legitimate, guys. They were serious. And here's why they were serious. They lived in a time of persecution. They lived in a time where when you signed up for Christianity, it could cost you your life. Are you ready for this? Number two, when they eventually graduated out of this process, they were part of a family. And we got to make sure the family is pure. In addition, they viewed them as a fellow soldier of Christ, literally. They would, at the end, and I'll get to that in a moment, but at the end, they actually made a declaration of following the commander-in-chief. And they viewed the Christian walk as military service. And when you go to war, and some of you have served in our armed forces, when you go to war, that guy next to you in the trench, you better, he, you better know he's solid. Because your life depends on him. And this was their viewpoint as well. So they took it really serious. So once you moved forward and you approved and, and everything was kosher with the first round, then you moved to stage two. Now, this is interesting. Stage two was a advanced two to three year training in scripture now it's interesting their worship service was a little different than ours i haven't come to your church and actually heard your worship service but i'm assuming it goes something like this because it's pretty much every church in america you come together you do opener welcome you have a couple songs you make some announcements you sometimes pass the offering plates though after covid sometimes we pay online just depends on you know what you do you sing a couple more songs if you have a choir you have an orchestra you have the band you have whatever they're you're doing this and then you close that and then pastor mark comes up and preaches pretty close pretty close all right sometimes you get a little off the rails okay mark when i pastored i would sometimes flip the service and preach first and sing at the end Ooh, that messed everybody up. <laughs> but they knew I was a little crazy, so they just came, went along with it. All right. Hey, if you're preaching about worship and worshiping our God, it's kind of cool to do that up front, and now let's worship our God. Okay, that's part of why I did some of that. Anyway, Mark, just giving you some ideas, all right? So this is, hey, there's a lot of stuff coming out of here. It's not, you know, some of this is just free information for everybody, even your pastor. All right. So all that to say, they, their church services were a little different. What they would do is they would do actually, there was some singing and then they would do the preaching up front. And then halfway through, they dismissed everybody who was not a member. And that's where you have communion and then you have family business. Okay, and they would deal with family business as a family. Okay, so these people that have graduated to stage two could go to that first part of the service. And then in addition, once or twice a week, depending on which city you were in and who your pastor was, it was typically once or twice a week for two to three years they were trained in the scriptures. And people often ask me, what were they taught during that time? Theology? Um, 
it's amazing. We have surviving um, in Cyril, there's a series of books called Nicene and Anti-Nicene Fathers. Anti-Nicene does not mean against Nicaea. It means after, okay? So there was um, Nicene and Anti-Nicene Fathers, and one of them is the, of Cyril of Jerusalem. It literally has all of his lectures still, like what he taught them. And gentlemen, it is packed with Scripture, because most of these people didn't have a Bible, okay? By the way, I'll come back to that in a minute. I want to hit us on that Bible again. But no, most of these people didn't have a Bible. So what they got about the Bible was from these teaching times. There was one of Cyril's lectures where he had over 100 quotations from different verses of Scripture. They taught them Scripture. They taught them theology. During this time, if you've studied theology, things like Gnosticism, the, the, the war with Arius and Athanasius, and some of these things in church history where they're defining who was Jesus, what's, what do we know, why are these the 66 books, all, all of those doctrinal disputes was during this time. So people had to be trained, who is Christ? Did he really die or did he soul sleep? All of these things. Was he just, did he just appear as a man but, or was he really truly man? These things we take for granted. This was when those battles were fought. And so people had to understand what Scripture taught. And so for two to three years, they went through this training. In addition, they taught him on moral living. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? What does this look like? How do we serve? At the end of this two to three year period, they move to stage three. Now, something interesting happens between stage two and stage, uh, stage three. Remember how I said they had to go before the elders to just get in? Here's where they come before the elders again. Now, this is interesting. There would be some quizzing and some testing verbally, kind of like a doctoral defense. <laughs> Do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know this? They're kind of grilling them a little bit. And then they bring in the godparent. Ready for this? The godparent had to attest before the leaders of the church whether that person was growing and serving in the body. Now, this is huge, because I'm often asked, what was, what, was the, what was more of this training? You know, head knowledge, teaching, or practical? And it's both. <laughs> Mentorship was huge, to the point where the mentor had to attest that they saw the growth in another person. Now, I hope your church is a little different than most churches. Most churches, this is how it goes Sunday morning. How are you doing? Good. How was your week? Great. Did you see that game yesterday? Yeah. Looking forward to the game tonight? Yes. Done. We roll. Do we know each other like this? Can you attest of a fellow brother the growth you've seen in a couple years of their life? These people, guys, these people were family. They knew each other. Because they went to war with each other. And so before they could move to stage three, this examination had to happen. And if everything was good and moved forward and the, the attestation was there, we saw this growth, we're seeing their knowledge of Scripture, we moved them to stage three. Now, if you didn't think this was intense enough, stage three lasted about a month. And they met three to five times a week <laughs> studying and being challenged. And it culminated on the Passion Week. Interestingly, we do baptisms kind of throughout the year. They did baptism on Easter Sunday every year. 
That was the only day they did baptism. And the week prior to baptism, they would come every single night. And during that time, they would go into these hour or two lessons and final preparations. And it culminated with a kind of a lock-in. We, we do a lock-in with the teens, right, where they come and spend the all-nighter and all this stuff. And I'm so glad I'm not a youth pastor anymore. I used to be. I can't stay up all night and do those lock-ins anymore. But we used to do those lock-ins. This is what this was. Friday night into Saturday was a lock-in. And through that night, they spent the entire night in prayer and memorizing the Apostles' Creed. Remember how I talked about they made the declaration of serving the commander-in-chief? They memorized the Apostles' Creed, and they would recite that Easter morning. And then they would be baptized. And their baptism, again, I wouldn't do it exactly like this, but their baptism was the graduation ceremony of this entire process. And at their graduation ceremony, at their baptism, they became members of the church. And now they're part of the family. So let me ask you. I did that pretty quick. Okay, Usually I do this about an hour or two, but I kind of hit the high points for you. What stands out from that to you? Right there it is. We'll hit some other ones. That's the biggest to me. The level of commitment with these individuals. This is serious. This is serious. What else stands out to you? I know. It's Saturday morning. You saw it. Here's this guy, bald dude, coming up here. Can't pronounce his last name. At least I can just sit here and get some good breakfast. All right? You got to help, okay? <laughs> Accountability, okay? The investment in the church. This was planned. All right, I heard a lot, so let me ping off a few of these. Commitment is there. Accountability. They knew it was... L- Discipleship is life on life. This was life on life. You can't attest to the elders of something that's transpired in somebody's life if you don't know them at all. They were life on life. Okay? There was one more before intentionality. The commitment from the church to each other. These folks fought alongside each other. And I don't mean literally with guns and knives and all. I'm talking a spiritual battle. They understood they were in a war. Most Christians wake up every day and go, all right, I'm good, let's just get about the day. Every day the enemy is trying to take you out You have a massive target on your back. And we don't even think that way. We don't wrestle, Paul says, against flesh and blood. Our warfare is way beyond just this. You have adversaries and enemies, and they hate you. Literally hate you. And we're not even thinking... We're not even, most Christians, we read the statistic, most Christians aren't even in the Word, so they're not suited up for battle. I'll go one step further. Most Christians don't even think they're in a war. And that's why they're losing it. And, quite frankly, that's why many pastors and leaders fall. Because they're not preparing themselves and guarding themselves. You need to pray for your pastors. You need to pray for Pastor Mark. Because the biggest target in this entire audience is on his back. Because if he goes down, the the sheep scatter. Satan hates this work. 
The fact that 50-some men are here on a Saturday morning ticks him off big time. And a lot of us don't even think that way. These are your fellow soldiers. We need to be committed to one another. And then it was intentional. Discipleship does not just happen by chance. It's not just nailing jello to a wall. It is something that is serious. That we think about. That we intentionally incorporate. And it drives how we go and study passages. Now, again, I'm not judging this church. I don't know it well enough to do so, and I wouldn't even if I did. But there's so many churches, it's just kind of we're preaching randomly or teaching randomly. I don't know where we're going. We don't even think about where we're going next. I challenge in my seminary classes, and I've got guys like Zach and others in those classes, and I challenge them this way. Have you thought through a scope and sequence of what you are teaching your middle schoolers and high schoolers? Because when they leave here and go out on their own, they are going to get bombarded by the world. Are they prepared to defend their faith? Do they know the Scriptures well enough where it's in them, not just in mom and dad? By the way, the black hole of the church, and that is the term that it's called, is the ages 18 to 27. They are leaving in droves. Why? Because mom and dad's faith is not their faith. And they can go through the motions and they can put on the act. And when it comes to real life, they don't have the answers. So when they get a liberal professor that says all the crazy stuff that they say, oh, that makes some sense. No, it doesn't. It's stupid. But what does the Bible say? The gospel is foolishness to those who are lost. And we, to a liberal professor, look like a bunch of idiots. They don't even believe in billions of years. No, I do not. I believe in a creator God. And he designed this creation and had intentionality in this creation and designed you and me. And by the way, just so we all know, evolution is an attack against that. Because if God is not the creator, then I'm not responsible to anybody. That's the core behind evolution. By the way, when Darwin died on his deathbed, he says, I was wrong. That's kind of fallen out of our textbooks. There was intentionality. Are we preparing our people systematically thinking through this is what we need to know. This is what they need to have. A new believer has to know this stuff. They need to know how to read their Bibles. These teenagers need to be trained up in these areas so that they don't abandon the faith. There was intentionality. There's a lot of lessons we can learn from these people. Would I do the program exactly the same? No. And there's some weird stuff they did that I didn't even get into, like exorcisms and everything else, okay? They're working through it all, all right? Calm down. It was during the setting up the church, right? (laughs) There's a a lot of uniqueness going on. But there's some serious lessons we can learn. Zach, I I put some on your handout, but I've got four that I want to challenge you with. I think it's that last slide, by the way. We are uh, done out of time. There it is. You may not be able to read this. Hopefully you can. Lessons for us. Church leaders, you men, must recognize the current state of discipleship. Where are we at? We've got to look at that, guys. 
Two, church leaders must develop systematic and intentional curriculum and programs for their churches. We need to be intentional. Three, church leaders must develop discipleship procedures that produce commitment and comprehensive change. These people were committed to Christ and to each other. And we need to emphasize mentorship in our community. There's some younger guys in this room. We'll hit on this later on in our time together, but I'm going to preview it now. Some of us have gray hair. Some of us have white hair. Some of us have no hair. <laughs> I love that verse. He counts the hairs of our head. That's pretty easy for me. It's pretty easy for you, too. Lord knows how many I drop out every day more than anything else. There's a reason we have gray and white hair. Because we lived through a lot. Some of you have been warriors for 40, 50, 60 years in the faith. These younger guys need to hear those battles. And by the way, maturity in Scripture is not just a numeric number. I've met a lot of dear saints who are 70, 80 years old and are still babes in the Lord. But those of us that are mature, we're going to talk about that in 2 Timothy 2 too, we need to pass this on to the next generation. These little guys that are here, these 20-year-olds that are here, they will carry the torch when we're gone. Now, I'm, I'm, some people are all over on the map on this. I'm pre-trib, pre-mill. I hope the rapture happens while I'm speaking. Okay, I'm good with that. Okay, <laughs> this place is a mess. Okay, <laughs> like, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I don't even, listen, I know where I'm voting. You know, I'm not even waiting until the election day. I'm voting early in North Carolina. That's just happening. Okay, and yeah, so I listen to those guys on the radio like, I just can't get too political. But anyway, I hope that election doesn't even happen. I'm good with just being in heaven, all right? But if the Lord tarries 50, 100 years, every one of us hearing the sound of my voice will be gone. Who's carrying the torch forward? We must be intentional. We must be committed. Guys, I went about five minutes long. Let's close in a word of prayer and take a little break for the next session. Lord, thank you for our time together. Thank you for these men and for their desire to be here this morning. When we look at the state of what's happening in the church today, we actually are alarmed by what we see. But it's easy to look out and say, hey, those people need to do it different and we need to change that and this. Help us to look internal and ask the question, where do I need to change? What is, should this look like in my life? Lord, help us to be disciples of yours. Help this church to be intentional in developing up committed followers of Jesus Christ. And may you use us as we serve you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. About a 10-minute break. Sound right? Tom, Mark, anybody? I'm getting thumb up, thumbs up. We'll be back at 9.30. You can't have the shirt yet.